good to see you guys. My name is Stephen. I'm the senior pastor here. And if this happens to be your first weekend with us, man, we're really glad that you guys are here. Um, we're in this series called Jesus. And what we've been doing is taking kind of a, a deep dive into who Jesus was and what that means for our own individual lives. And so today we're gonna be learning about Jesus, the Messiah. And I'm gonna come at it from a little different angle. Um, today is Palm Sunday. It's a big deal. It starts the beginning of Holy Week. It, it marks that very stark um, deliberate turn toward the cross that ultimately leads us to the empty tomb, which is in and of itself the essence of the Easter story. Um, but I want to kind of start off here. Um, is it fair to say, I assume you guys would agree, that we all like a good story, right? Like, I've never met anybody that's like, well, that story was just too awesome, man. I can't handle that again. I mean, we all like a good story. And so I want to uh, ask you, if you would, to just be really honest with this. I want you to think about how much you love a good story and then what you're actually willing to do for that good story. So I want you to be really honest, because look, at this point, look at everything you've done to get here, right? Like you got up, you got dressed, you wrestled the kids into the car, you fought through the weather, you guys looked great, you sounded great while you were singing, and so why not just kind of go all in and be completely honest? Here's what I want you to do. Raise your hand if this is true of you. Are you someone who binge watched a show at least one time this past year? Would you raise your hand? I'm talking like two episodes or more, all right? Throw your hand up, look around. I can't believe y'all would admit that at church. That's incredible. I mean, it, it, it's proof, right, that we love a good story. And this idea, this concept of binge watching is a relatively new phenomenon. Like when I was growing up, some of you guys remember this, right? We only had three channels. So if there's a show coming on you wanted to watch, you had to watch it when they put it on the television. And eventually, if there was a show you wanted to rewatch, you could record it on a tape. Like I know, I know a lot of us don't know what tapes are, but you could record a TV show and go back and watch it later. But now when they just, they just sort of release the whole thing at one time. I mean, Netflix has changed and ruined our lives by creating binge watching, right? And I know, listen, if they just released all of Game of Thrones today, right? Would that be awesome or you like it one week at a time? Or you don't care, okay, great. <laughs> Love it. Well, as you might imagine, um, people, this has been around long enough that people have actually started doing some research on this stuff. And what they found is that about 70% of Americans admit to binge watching at least one show this last year, and here's what's really interesting about it. They found that the average person who does binge watch, they'll watch on average between four and six hours of a show at a time. That's the average, y'all, so that means some of y'all are cranking out the hours in front of Netflix. I mean, maybe you've pulled a marathon like that, right? Well, have you ever thought about why that is? Like, why are we so addicted to binge watching a show? Why can't we just enjoy one episode at a time, as it is, and then move on to something else? Why do we have to keep on going? See, I don't think it's just because of accessibility or like availability, although that may, may be a part of it. I think it's actually because there's something inside most of us. I bet you're like this too. We both love and hate a good cliffhanger. Like we can't leave things unresolved. We gotta finish it up because there's characters involved, right? We can't just leave the characters hanging out there. We gotta know what happens next. And so we go into the next episode and the next episode and some of us go on to the next episode because none of us like unresolved stories. <clears throat> we like it to be wrapped up. In fact, it even gives us a great sense of accomplishment, right? Like. I just finished six seasons in two days. I didn't go outside and I didn't even shower for the whole weekend and we'll, we'll high five each other and we'll post it on social media, all proud of ourselves for, for wasting an entire weekend watching shows. And again, it's because we fundamentally want resolution. But y'all, I think this goes way beyond our viewing preferences. I think it actually speaks to something that's true about the human heart. It's probably true about your heart. It is definitely true about my heart, which is we don't like unresolved seasons or chapters in our own story. 
We don't like to go through parts that don't make sense. We don't like parts that don't have answers, that don't get wrapped up in a pretty little bow at the end of that season. We don't like that. We like things all wrapped up and have them always make sense. And if that's true, then it would be logical, if you were honest enough with yourself this morning, it would be logical that you would eventually come to a place, if you're even remotely interested in God, you'd have to ask the question, does God have a plan for all the things in my life, for all the things in my story that I don't understand? Like honestly, does God see and does he know, and more specifically, does he actually care about all of the difficult and all the trying, all the complicated and all the complex seasons of our lives? And then what about the really painful and the sometimes heartbreaking and the often overwhelming chapters of our lives? Does God see that? Does God know, does he care? Does he have a plan for those parts of our story? See, that's an important question because those are the parts of our story that we don't like to talk about. And those are the parts of our story that we'll do almost anything to keep hidden or to deny actually exist. And yet it is those parts of our stories that really get some of us sideways when it comes to our relationship with God. There's a word that's associated with this longing to know. And if you grew up in church, you may have heard this word. It is a churchy word. In fact, you probably haven't used it in a sentence this week. It's the word sovereignty, the idea that God is sovereign. And we understand what sovereign nations are and the right to rule, but when you think about God, that word sovereign means that God is in control and that God actually has a plan. And if you've heard that word before, you may find it easy to go, well, sure, yeah, I get that. God is sovereign. I can believe that God is sovereign. At least I want to believe that God is sovereign. But here's the deal. Settling the issue of God's sovereignty is not something you do in your mind. It can only be done inside of our hearts. Because when it comes to the sovereignty of God, the belief that God is in control and that God does have a plan, it ultimately requires this thing called trust. Not belief, but trust. Do I trust that God is both great and good? Do I trust that he is in control and he sees every aspect, every detail, every chapter, every season of my life? Do I really trust? Like not can I talk a good game or not can I put up a facade for an hour or so a week, but I'm talking about in the deep, dark moments of the night where it's just me and my thoughts and I'm staring up at the ceiling. Do I really trust that God has everything in control and that God has a plan for my life? And so what I, that's what I want us to get into with the few minutes we have left. Does God have a plan and is it God in control of the parts of my life that seem so out of control or that seem to not make sense or that are still unresolved. Now here's what I know about you guys. I've been testing this all weekend. It's proven true every service. You guys, whether you know it or not, are biblical scholars. And you may not think of yourself as a big biblical scholar, but here's what I bet you know. You know that the Bible is divided into basically two parts, right? You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. See, we have some scholars among us. The Old Testament is the part of the story before Jesus, and the New Testament is the story about Jesus' life and then everything after his death. In fact, that division, that line that we see with Jesus is so significant, and Jesus is so central to human history that we've actually divided time by. There's B.C., which is before Christ, and then there's A.D., which means the time of our Lord. And it's easy to look at the Bible in the same way. It's sort of pre jesus and post-Jesus. But what I want us to see is that, that, that this thread of Jesus is woven throughout every page of the book. And beyond that, it's also woven throughout every chapter of your story and my story. There are 400 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. And they speak to very real and very specific Events. Many of them were spoken hundreds, some even thousands of years before Jesus 
was ever born, and yet he ended up fulfilling every single one of them. The sovereignty of God, the fact that he is in control and that he has a plan, it shows up right off the bat in the story of the human race. This is Genesis chapter three. It's where we first to begin, begin to see Jesus in the story of humanity. And if, if you're taking notes, you can follow along. Um, here's a little bit of context for you in case you're not familiar with the story. In Genesis chapter one and chapter two, God created the whole earth. That's everything that we can see and everything that we can know. And then he creates every living creature and finally he creates Adam and Eve. And when he creates Adam and Eve, he places them in a garden and he says to them, in essence, look, everything that I've created, as far as your eye can see, I've created this for you. I want you to enjoy it, man. Have a blast, soak it up, it is beautiful. But then in the center of the garden, he plants one tree. And he says, everything that you see is yours except for this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to eat from that tree. And the reason that God placed that tree there is because he actually wanted them to have a choice. Because here is just a basic truth. You cannot have real love if you don't have real choice. The two cannot coexist. And so he says, I want to give you a choice. I want you to choose whether or not you're going to love me. And if you know anything about the story, you know that they chose to eat from the tree. They got deceived by Satan in the form of a serpent. And that ultimately separated them from God. That's where sin enters into the human story. And so right after that happened, God is handing out these sentences of new realities as a result of their choice. And then check out what happens in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. Now I wanna pump the brakes right there. You will crawl on your belly. What did snakes do before they crawled? <laughs> Any of y'all afraid of snakes? I, I don't like snakes. And the thought of them walking around with feet and hands. <laughs> you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now, this is where it gets really interesting, verse 15. And I will put enmity, which is division, separation, and tension, between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So what God is saying is, is that one day from this woman, there's gonna come a son. And you, Satan, are gonna try to snatch victory by biting at his heel. You're going to try to kill him. But what you don't realize, even in this moment, is that that heel is ultimately going to crush you. And he'll defeat sin and death once and for all. So what I need you to understand, Satan, is that the clock is ticking and your elimination is coming. So in Genesis chapter 3, God is already giving us a spoiler alert to Easter. He was saying all the way back then that there is going to come a day. There is now a path that ultimately leads to the cross. I am in control, I've got a plan, I got this. And y'all, I think it's important for us to, to think about our own stories. Because here's the truth about your story and it is certainly true about my story. Every one of our stories are filled with choices. Some of them were great choices, some of them were not good choices. Some of them led us toward life but many of them lead us away from life. That's how sin works. It causes separation, it creates a void. It leaves us with unresolved chapters or seasons of our lives that often don't make sense. And when it comes to sin, that's, that's like the word you don't wanna talk about in church, right? Because it, it freaks people out. We, we use other words like, well, I just want to be a better person, or man, I really messed up, or I tripped along the way, or I've had a few stumbling blocks along the road. No, it, it's sin. It's, it's just there. It's, it's a part of your life and my life. Every human being struggles with it, and yet what God is saying is, I got a plan, and I'm in control in spite of that sin. I'll, I'll put it this way. Before you were anything, you were everything to God. And I got a feeling there's somebody in this room that needs to hear that. Before you were anything, you were everything to God. God made a way for you before he ever made you. Because listen, I know 
that there's a lot of power that comes with sin. I know about the guilt. I know about the shame. I know about the frustration. I know about the isolation. I know how it feels. And it's easy sometimes to allow that voice to speak into your life, to begin to tell you that maybe what you did was too bad, like maybe there's not enough room for God, like maybe God has just sort of forgotten about you or abandoned you, and it's easy for that voice to ring so loud in our ears that we lose sight of the fact that, man, that's not the case, that God never asked any human being to be perfect. All God asks is that we learn to trust. That's why we say every single week there are no perfect people at this church. If you're looking for perfect people, you've come to the wrong place because every single one of us on some level is jacked up. That's just a part of the human condition. But what you will find in this room are a whole bunch of beggars who are trying to show another beggar where to find bread. So if you're here today and you're struggling, I want you to take heart because the power of your sin does not have to have the final say in your life. Let's move on. Turn a little bit more uh, to the right, Psalm 22. David, a great leader, the first real kind of true great king of Israel, before he becomes king, he finds himself in a really dark season of his life. The guy that he's following named Saul is out trying to kill him. And every one of David's friends had turned their backs and ran away from him. And at this moment, he doesn't even know where God is, and he certainly doesn't know what God is up to. So it's a dark, difficult, unresolved chapter, if you will, in his story. And in that moment, he sits down and he pins this prayer. Now check out the language that David uses in Psalm 22, verse 16. He comes out of the chute, like starts out. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. I mean, think about how boring your average prayer is compared to that. Like, he's throwing down some language. God. Dogs surround me. And Lord, there are villains all around me. They be thieving on me, Lord. He's like, God, this is how it feels. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. And then notice the language. They pierce my hands and feet. All my bones are on display. Not literally, but that's how it felt. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Does that not sound like the story we're gonna remember on Friday? See, the gospel writers make sure we know that the way they secured Jesus' body to the cross was by driving nails through his wrists and his feet. Most of his friends were not there on the day he was crucified. They were scared for their own lives and so they turned their backs and ran away from him. One of his best friends had actually betrayed him and was the reason he found himself in that moment. So the crowd that had gathered there that day, apart from a couple of his members of his family, they were there simply to mock and to hurl insults at him. After he died, the Roman soldiers who had put Jesus to death, they cast lots. They actually gambled to see who got the last of his earthly possessions, which would have been the clothes on his body. Now y'all, I ain't a rocket scientist. But I don't think that David had any idea when he knelt and prayed that prayer that one day there would be one who would come who would know exactly what he was experiencing. So that means God must be up to something. God is showing us that he understands our suffering. He's reminding us that Jesus knows exactly what we're going through. He understands the pain. He gets the agony. He can identify with the isolation and the loneliness. He knows and he's reminding us that he can walk us through whatever it is that you're going through. You are not alone. And sometimes you just gotta believe it. I know what it feels like to sit in a room full of people and feel like you're the only person on the planet Earth that knows what you're going through, but listen, you're not alone. God was with you before you were even thought up by your parents. He was with you through every dark moment you've ever been through in your life, even if you couldn't feel him. He is with you right now. One more for Isaiah 53. I love Isaiah, man. Isaiah was a prophet who spoke to the people of God about God. And he comes along at this incredibly um, dark and difficult moment in Israel's history. 
And they were at a point where they had kind of all forgotten about God and they certainly believed that God had forgotten about them. And so this guy, Isaiah, God calls him, he steps up to speak to the people and he begins to prophesy, ironically, about the very same thread that we saw in Psalm 22. He says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced, there's that word again, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. By his wounds, all of our wounds find healing. See, this is a suffering savior who trusted that God was sovereign all the way to the end. Isaiah goes on to say about all of us, if we were honest, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. Now, again, I don't know if Isaiah really understood what he was throwing down right here in chapter 53, that he was actually speaking about Jesus because this got dropped 700 years before Jesus was born. It was a very dark and difficult moment in their story, and they assumed that God has moved on from them. And yet what God is doing is he's showing them that no matter how bad things may seem, and no matter how isolated and separated they may feel, no matter how fleeting hope may seem, there is always a path that leads to life. And I bet many of us, if we were honest, we've had seasons in our own lives where we assume that God had forgotten about us. And so maybe you showed up to church today simply to be reminded that God has not left you and God has not abandoned you. You have not been forsaken. And listen, I know that you always ask yourself the question, does God really know? Does he care what I'm going through? If that's you, I wanna encourage you because if God can weave together literally thousands and thousands of years, generation after generation after generation, through all sorts of sin and wandering, if God can weave a, a path that leads to the cross, then he can certainly do the same thing for you. And listen, it may not go the way you want it to go. And you may have to go down a path that you would not have chosen for yourself, but that does not mean that God is not present. And it does not mean that whatever you're facing right now, there is not a path that leads to life. See, God is sovereign. God is in control. He does have a plan for your life and my life. And that plan was set in motion from the very beginning of the human race. And it begins to culminate on this day that we've gathered to celebrate Palm Sunday. Here's how Matthew, one of Jesus' best friends, tells the story. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. So already Jesus is trying to entice them to commit grand theft donkey, right? <laughs> if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Again, there's Jesus leaning into the sovereignty of God. He's in control, he's got a plan. You don't even have to speak my name. When you come, just tell the dude that the Lord needs them and he's gonna go ahead and give them to you because I believe that God's got a plan. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, that's the followers of God. See, your king has come to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did it as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and placed their colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees and spread them along the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Which I would have asked the same thing. The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And y'all, listen, everybody that saw those city gates swing open, they thought that this was gonna be the moment. 
that the long anticipated king that they've been waiting on century after century, literally thousands of years, the long anticipated king would finally take his rightful seat. That justice, something they had been denied their entire life long, would finally flow like a river. That things would finally once and for all be made right. That Rome, their oppressors, would finally be overthrown and they'd get back every single thing that had been taken away from them. But what they failed to see is that Jesus did come to be both Savior and Lord, but the, the deliverance, the freedom that he was offering, it wasn't just about alleviating the pain of a specific circumstance, which that would be awesome, but it's much deeper than that. He came to actually restore the human heart, to liberate the human soul, to bring freedom not only in the life that is to come, but to bring freedom in the life that we're living right now. See, Jesus was the culmination of God's plan. He was the lamb that was gonna be slain to make everything right with God once and for all. He was the catalyst that would ultimately change all of human history. He was the way that God would finally, once and for all, across all of, hum of, of the ages, prove that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that God does have a plan and that he has made a way out for every single human being. See, make no mistake about it, friends. This king, he is everything that every single one of us could ever long for or wish for or hope for. And it's not just in some life that's off there in the distance. It can be achieved right now. I know one of the things the church has gotten so wrong over the years is we've taught people that being in a relationship with Jesus, it's about meeting the minimal entrance requirements so you can go to heaven when you die. And listen, I hope I get to go to heaven. But in all honesty, I hope heaven's a long way away. Because <laughs> I got kids to finish raising. And I got a wife I wanna love a little bit longer. And I got kids that still need to get married. I got grandbabies that hadn't even been thought of yet that I'd like to meet someday. I got an incredible church that I'd like to continue leading for a little while longer. So if, if just getting to heaven is the end result, well, that's, that's awesome. But what we fail to remember is it's not just getting yourself into heaven. It's the possibility of what life can be like right now. See, that's the message of God's sovereignty that however your life is going right now, it could go a whole lot better. Not that things are always gonna go the way you want it to go, but when things do get bad and when they do get hard and when you do fall flat on your face and when you do get a diagnosis you didn't see coming, there's always a baseline of peace that is present that reminds you that no matter how out of control or unresolved your story may feel right now, God is in control. He has not forgotten about you and beyond being in control, he's got a plan for your life. I mean, it's unbelievable. And yet, why don't more of us live that way? In the confidence that we've got the King of kings and Lord of lords who laid down his life just so he could sit on the throne of, of every single one of our hearts. See, it always requires a choice. I've got to allow him to be king in my life. Will I give him my allegiance or will I keep trying to do things my way? Will I surrender to his way or will I try to stay in control? You gotta respond to Jesus. You cannot be indifferent. And yes, he's trying to get us to heaven when we die but maybe even more importantly, he's trying to get heaven into us while we live. And what would it be like if you said yes to Jesus? And listen, I already know how some of y'all are feel, thinking. Well, Stephen, I gave my life to Jesus a long time ago. I ain't talking about your salvation. I'm talking about who's the driving force in your life. I'm not talking about being a better person. I'm not talking about sinning less. I'm saying, who's the guiding force in your life? Is it you or is it Jesus? You gotta respond. 
we've got a group of people that are gonna respond today and they've been responding all weekend long. So I want you guys um, first to meet uh, Annabelle and Brady. You guys here? Where y'all at? Yep, come on down. This is um, Brady and Annabelle. These guys, um, Brady is about to start confirmation, um, which if you're a United Methodist, you're familiar with that. It's a, a season that we put our students through to help them learn about the church and learn about Jesus. They're given an opportunity um, to respond to the gospel and to take their next steps and eventually join the church. And so um, Brady has not yet started that process. Annabelle um, has completed confirmation. And both of these guys are standing before you because they've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and they're ready to take their next step and take their faith public by getting baptized. And so um, before we introduce the rest of the confirmation class to you, I just wanted to tell you guys I'm incredibly proud of you, man. I mean, it's a, it's a huge step. And um, for me, it's not the end of something, but it's the beginning of the life that you guys are choosing to live with Jesus. So there are three questions we ask everyone who wants to be baptized. And the first is, do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins? Do you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And are you guys standing here to be baptized in the Christian faith? All right, come on over here. Would you guys please stand? Brady, it's an honor and a privilege to get to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This moment marks the public moment that you move from death back to life. Okay. Annabelle, it's an honor and a privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This too marks the moment that you move from death back to life. Amen. <clears throat> so that's powerful stuff, man. And then uh, if you guys will say good morning to Josh French, he's our student minister. Um, he's got some folks. Y'all need to say good morning to this dude. So, yeah, it's okay. Um, so we got a couple of other people that we want you guys to meet. Yeah, so uh, you've already met Annabelle uh, Taylor Evans. I want to introduce you to Kate Ford. Come on up here, Kate. Uh, Ellie Harshbarger, Olivia Morris, and Luke Tanner. So here's what's cool about these guys. Um, they're in uh, finishing up that confirmation. Listen, I know it's a weird word for some of you guys because you didn't grow up in the church, but you know, that process that these guys have been through, like if, if you and I had to go through it, a lot of us wouldn't make it. Like they've been through this intense thing. And so um, they're here to, to all of them are professing their faith. Um, Kate and Luke were baptized when they were kids, but they want to remember their baptism today. And um, they, you know, obviously were babies. And so they want to publicly acknowledge that today. And so I'm gonna ask them the same questions of baptism I'm going to baptize them the same way I would baptize anybody, but I want you guys to know that they're reaffirming what's already been done for them. And so, um, Luke, come on down here, brother. Kate, you want to slide down just a little bit? Good. So the questions are the same. Um, first is, do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins? Do you guys profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And are you here today to declare your belief in Jesus and to remember your baptism? All right. Well, Kate, it's an honor and a privilege to do for you that which has already been done, which is to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Likewise, Luke, it's an honor and a privilege to share a moment of remembrance as you remember that you were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Proud of you guys. <laughs> now, <clears throat> here's the important question, okay? Um, you guys are standing on your profession of faith in Jesus. You guys have been through your next steps. So now you're coming to the third step, which is joining our church. And I want you to know, and I hope you guys have heard me say as I've been able to be with you, you're not the church of tomorrow. You're the church of right now. And God has given you guys grace and given you abilities. You've got an opportunity to impact the world. And so I don't want you to see this as a last step, but a first step that you're gonna live the rest of your days trying your best to follow Jesus and do what you can to make a difference in the lives of your friends. And so with that, I wanna ask you guys one question, which is, do you agree to uphold Cokesbury with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Nice, well, welcome to Cokesbury Church. Thank you guys very much. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Oops, excuse me. You guys can be seated. So you guys may be seated. And listen, we got two minutes left. I'm gonna dismiss you guys, okay? 
but I want you to take your next step too. And um, it's been powerful, man, to watch kids um, do what they've done all weekend. We've baptized kids and they've joined our church. And it's been unbelievable to see them find the courage to stand up in the spotlight and take a next step. But I wanna challenge you guys, give you a little bit of homework, right? There's nothing wrong with homework every once in a while. What's that area? What's that thing that you've been thinking about over the past half hour or so? What's that place that you know you need to give God access to? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's something going on at your job or something happening at your school. Um, maybe it's some other relational issue that you're dealing with. Maybe it's an addiction that you know is there and you've been battling privately on your own and you know that you don't have the strength to get over it or to get through it. Maybe it's that thought pattern or that behavior that's been there. Maybe, maybe it's more random than that. Maybe it's just that fear or that worry or that thing that's keeping you up at night. Maybe it's just that distance that you've been feeling between you and God for a long time. I want to give you a seven-day challenge. Because I know not all y'all are going to come back Thursday and Friday, but I do bet most of you will be here next Sunday. So that's seven days. Over the next seven days, can you just pray a simple prayer of God, I give you access to whatever that thing is. I just give you access to whatever that area of my life is and I want you to be keen. See, I think that's where freedom comes. It's when we're able to release and give God access to every part of our life where we just admit that, you know what, I can't control everything. I'm gonna do my part, but God, I need you to be in control. So I think if you'll do that over the next seven days, when we gather together next weekend, and listen, y'all, don't roll up in this service at 1140, like some of y'all normally do, because this place is gonna be a madhouse. But I have a feeling you'll come back a little bit more free. And I think that no matter what happens to you over the next seven days, you'll be able to gather with us and we'll be able to proclaim together that there's a reason to have hope because the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. And so I'd like to ask you if you would to stand your feet. I'm gonna dismiss you guys. We're gonna have a quick word of prayer and then you guys can get on your way. Let's pray together. Gracious God, I give you thanks for the gift of this day and I thank you for Cokesbury Church and God, I thank you for the power of your word. And I thank you that you are a sovereign God, whether we realize it or not, that you are in control and that you do have a plan. And God, I pray that as we walk out of the doors of this place or as we turn off the feed from wherever we're watching, that your presence and power will be with us all week long. God, allow us the grace to open up our hearts, to make room for you this week so that by the time we see each other together again, we're ready to proclaim the good news that Jesus is alive. God, be with us now as we leave this place. Give us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Keep us safe until we have a chance to see each other again. For it's in the name of the resurrected Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. We'll see you next week.